Welcome to a Date with Darkness podcast, where I will be discussing the impact of hurtful and abusive relationships and how to overcome them so that you can move through your pain and get to the kind of healthy relationships you want, need, and deserve. I'm Dr. Natalie Jones. I'm a licensed psychotherapist based in California. While I hope that you find this podcast educational and informational, please note it should not be substituted for treatment with a licensed mental health professional. Also, due to the nature of the podcast, some of the information presented on the show can be sensitive to some of my listeners. So please note that listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome back to the show. How are you? It's so good to be back and chatting with you guys. Um, I um, I miss talking to you guys, um, you know, on the podcast, uh, you know, so I, I have a real treat coming up for you today as always. Um, of course, we like to get the administrative stuff out of the way, as we usually do. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about content that you listen to on the show, email me at a date with darkness at gmail.com. And if you are looking for blogs, resources, and um, you want to sign up for my email newsletter, which comes out, typically comes out every Friday morning, um, head on over to drnataliejones.com and, um, you know, you can sign up for the email list there. Currently, I have an ebook on how to find red flags in dating and your relationships. Um, and it's a little quiz you can kind of give yourself and go through that there. Um, I think that that would be very beneficial to you if you're kind of, um, if you're having trouble, you know, discerning whether or not um, there are some, some questionable behaviors in your relationships. That's an excellent uh, starter checklist for you. Also, one way to help out uh, the podcast is if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, like, and follow the podcast. Um, it also is great if you leave a written review on iTunes. That way people can find the podcast. It can definitely help to increase the ranking so that more people can find the podcast. And if you are looking for support, um, you know, and you want to provide support for other people that are currently healing from abusive relationships, head on over to the Facebook group, A Date with Darkness Facebook group. And lastly, the other thing that I will mention is um, to, if you're interested in getting um, or being a part of the group membership program, be sure to get on the mailing list. Um, and the landing page is in the show notes down below. So you can click on that and be the first to know when individual and group coaching membership slots open up. All right. So thank you so much for sitting with me through that. You know, I feel like that's such a mouthful to say. Um, but anyhow, it's some of the tidbits of listening to the show. So for today's guest, I have Britt Frank. She is a licensed clinical social worker, and she's going to be with us today. And Britt and I are going to have a discussion about emotional incest and, you know, trauma bonding and her experiences with that. Um, Britt has also written a book, which she talks about in the podcast and sort of uh, we, we kind of go through, you know, what emotional incest is and what that looks like. Um, and, you know, so she's going to break it down for us. And I, I have to say, um, I really love doing this interview with her because her examples resonate. And I think we have a thoughtful discussion here. So without further ado, here's the interview that I had with Brett Frank. Hello and welcome to the show, Brett. It's so nice to have you on. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> so for everyone who's not familiar with you and who you are, what you do, can you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah. So, you know, the shiny professional forward facing resume is I'm a trauma specialist and a psychotherapist. And I just wrote a book called the science of stuck. And then the icky, I don't lead with it, but still true part of my story is I was a drug addict and Ooh. really strange, weird, kind of emotionally incestuous, et cetera, and other types of childhood trauma and crazy addictive relationships as an adult. So I really came to this work from my own <laughs> my own healing. I didn't learn it out of a book. Well, not only out of a book. I read all the books too, but that's me. Okay. All right. So many directions we can take that today. Um, and thank you for being so candid and sharing that. Um, one question I have for you is what sort of drives the passion behind what you do? I love that question so much. So I wish I could say it's in service to humanity and it's to help other people, but that's actually more of a byproduct and it's a great byproduct. But my passion is driven by the transformation that happens when I had accurate information. I really think, you know, not knowing what's going on in our minds and our bodies leads to so much chaos and feelings of craziness and shame. And I am incredibly passionate about people not wandering around, not knowing things. Like I spent my whole life not knowing things because if I had known what I know now, then it would have been maybe a little easier. I don't regret my path, but you know, I certainly wouldn't wish it on anybody else. Can you describe a little bit more about what you mean about not knowing what's going on in your body yeah. and everything? Cause I feel like a lot of people could probably resonate with that. Yeah, well, you know, things like anxiety, you know, when we have that full body feeling of dread and impending doom and like your heart's going to pound out of your chest or like your, you know, I used to think my brain was going to explode and I was just going to go crazy and not knowing that that is not necessarily a you problem, mm -hmm. that a lot of what we call our issues are actually things in the environment or systemic issues, or, you know, a lot of times what we feel and think are very reasonable responses to the environment, but we don't know that. So if I'm depressed and unmotivated and stuck on my couch, I'm going to call myself lazy when really it's, it's almost never, I, I'll say never. I have never seen a case where if you get close enough up to a person's story that there's just like, you're just a lazy person or you're just a broken person, that there are reasons why we feel and think what we do. And if there's an origin to it, then there's a solution for it. And so, you know, whatever the symptom is, whether it's the really extreme stuff or, you know, just a feeling of uncomfort and unease and just discontent about your life, those, those feelings don't mean that you're crazy. There is no such thing as a crazy person. Mm, thank you for validating everybody. And uh, especially at a time where I feel like people are on edge in general, there's a state of like mental unrest there's a state of people just being tired, um, angry and frustrated. Like you can almost feel like the world is sort of pulsating right now with people just kind of being driven, driven to their limit. Um, and I like what you had to say, because I too also agree with your sentiments. And I tell people that I work with all the time, you know, those symptoms, they're really telling you something. Um, so you should pay attention to it instead of dismissing it and invalidating it. I'm wondering for you, where, where did the awareness come from that it wasn't just um, you being lazy? It wasn't just you being crazy. Where did the where did the happy medium come in or where did the light bulb moment come in and say, where you said like, no, this is, this is something more than what I thought it was. You know, I wish, and I've said this before, I wish I had this like light bulb sort of shift of insight that pivoted me into a path of healing. And it was so not that cool. It mm. was more like messing up, making mistakes, learning a few things, but not doing them, hearing a few pieces of information, but not listening to it and sort of crawling through the muck of my life. And then after a while I looked around and it was like, Oh, my, my life's not like 
totally crap anymore. Well, wait a minute. It actually was disorienting to me to realize that my life had started to work. And then I had to sort of sit on, you know, sit down and take inventory of, well, what the hell just happened over the last, you know, 25 years. And that's when I started, that's really when the insight came was after I sort of found my way to what we would call quote sanity. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked around and went, oh, wow. What was that? Oh, I wish I had the insights along the way, but I really, they were more like little glimmers. You know, someone would tell me, Hey, you have an amygdala. That's your brain's panic button. And if it goes off, you're going to feel this. Oh, that's really interesting. But then I go about doing whatever, but over time, those little pieces of information add up. Mm. You had described yourself as someone who had struggled with addiction. Can you describe sort of the overarching themes of what was going on in your life prior to that struggle? So I, you know, looking back, I really think ever since early childhood, I have always been an, a quote, addict. Now I don't identify as an addict. I don't believe that this is who you are, nor do I believe in the quote addictive. I just have an addictive personality. Like, can we be genetically predisposed to certain things? Like, of course, but from a very early age, I was addicted to dissociation and addicted to fantasy. I was addicted to just like escaping through books. Like my parents used to have to pull books out of my hand and force me to sit at the dinner table because that, I, you know, the common thread to any addiction, whether it's workaholism, like the socially acceptable ones, like working or exercise or whatever, or the not so socially acceptable ones is escape from pain. All addiction is not good, but all addiction does serve a function. And that was the function, pain avoidance. Yeah. Well, yeah, pain avoidance. And I, de I definitely, I think that resonates with me and a lot of people in terms of, you know, I don't think of addiction as a problem, but it's a problematic coping strategy. And so, you know, it's not uncommon for people who want to escape um, pain or chaos in their household to also escape through books and things like that. Books take you literally to another world. So um, it's good to hear you, you, you piece those things together that just, just trying to get out so it sounds like things weren't good for some time or you just sort of developed a strong coping mechanism of just taking your your mind somewhere else I have such a healthy, you know, addiction, of course, annihilates our sense of well-being and destroys our lives and can be deadly. And I have tremendous respect for the parts of us that, you know, that found a way that found any way. So whether it's my own process or the people I work with, when they say, you know, here is my addiction, let's start with, okay, well, bravo, you know, you're alive, which means the addiction works. It's not functional. It's not optimal. It's not excusable. And we're certainly not minimizing the harm you caused or the harm I caused, mm. but we have to have respect for the, the fact that our systems will do anything to keep us alive and to keep us safe. And if, you know, nobody conscious is there to help, they will find unconscious things like addiction or maladaptive behaviors, yeah. but it's not, again, it's not insanity and it's not a moral failing. It's, you know, in the absence of accurate information and resources, addiction is a, not a good, but a certainly a functional way to get out or get through or survive or cope or whatever. And I'm not saying it's a great one or a good one, Absolutely but it's, not. it's functional. Yeah. It's yeah. And I think anytime you do things, um, you know, whether it's, you know, an addiction or not, but anytime you do things beyond, um, a moderate amount, it's any, even if it's a good thing, it's, it doesn't, it's, it loses its value as being good quote unquote, um, the more you do it. And it just, it definitely def becomes avoidance and escapism at that point. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. You've talked about being stuck, like emotionally stuck. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and what that, why, why we get stuck? 
<laughs> I don't know one person, no matter how healthy or how successful or how functional doesn't have at least one area mm -hmm. where we get stuck. I mean, welcome to humanity. Mm -hmm. So the definition that I use, I'll get into the why, but the definition of stuck that I use is if you have the resources and you have the ability to do something and you're not doing it, that's being stuck. You know, if you live in an oppressive environment and you're not able to launch your business or manifest your reality, that's not you being stuck. That's you being subject to oppression or systemic injustice. Mm -hmm. not, that's not stuck. When I say stuck, I'm specifically referring to there's no logical reason why you're not doing the thing. And yet, nevertheless, there's this giant gap between what you're saying you want and what you're actually choosing to do. So mm -hmm. that's what I define as stuck. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we get stuck? stuck. There's three primary reasons. One is fear. There's a really good reason why we don't do things because it's scary to do things. Mm -hmm. The other is comfort. If the pain of doing the ch changing is hard and it's painful. Mm -hmm. So if that pain feels like it's going to be worse than the pain of being uncomfortable doing what you're doing, you're not going to do it. So it's either fear, comfort, or lack of access to either information or the resources you need. If I don't know that I have a brain and that my brain does things that keeps me stuck, I'm just gonna think I'm lazy, crazy, or unmotivated. And that's just not true. So fear, comfort, and information is why we get stuck. Mm. How do we know that we're stuck? Like if someone's listening to this and they're having trouble sort of discerning whether or not they're stuck, whether or not it's just um, maybe laziness or maybe it's just too many things on my plate or whatever the case they may be telling themselves. How do they know that they're actually stuck? What are some telltale signs? Well, I don't fundamentally actually believe that there's such a thing as laziness. Again, if, you, mm. if you're going to be really honest about what's going on for you, look at your environment, look at your relationships, look at you know what is actually happening. And if you're not doing what you want to be doing, I guarantee you there's unaddressed pain, there's untended to grief, or there is something in your environment that's pushing on you, making it you know impossible to do. It's really hard to go out and make a bunch of sales calls or go for a run when you're facing a world that looks the way our world does, let alone if you have children that you're trying to navigate through this world, let alone with a pandemic. Mm. And so, you know, look at the environment before you label yourself as lazy, you That's know, a good, good point. And watch how, in terms of watching how you talk to yourself and, you know, just also maybe even minimizing or undermining uh, the power of your actual mental health. Right. And I think, you know, people, especially people who don't have a lot of like overt things going wrong, like, okay, we're all healthy and we have enough food and the lights are on. Who am I to say that I feel like I'm in pain and we invalidate our pain because we compare yeah. Now, perspective is good. Like, yeah, it's great that you can hold space for, they have it worse than you do. That's important, mm -hmm. but or ands recognizing that they have it pretty tough down the street is no, in no way going to make you healthier, happier, or more useful to yourself or your, to, you know, to your community. Mm -hmm. So we need to hold space for multiple realities. Yes. I'm grateful. Yes. I have it pretty good and I'm in pain and I feel stuck and I need some help too. You know, it's, it's not a either or me or you it's, you know, we all get stuck and we all need help from time to time in different areas. And that needs to be okay. Okay, so, and again, this probably sounds like an age old question, but how do we get unstuck? <laughs> how do we, how do we sort of move the pendulum and get the momentum going? I wish I had like a here are five easy steps to getting out of stuff. <laughs> the answer, and I can answer the question, is not popular and is not pretty. And people, a lot of people, myself included, for a long time, didn't want to hear about it. Mm. And the answer is radical acceptance mm. and radical awareness and honesty about what is true for you, about you, about your life. Because if we're not willing to take an honest look at 
You know, what have been the injuries that have been inflicted upon me? How have I injured other people as a result of the, in- again, no, excuse- we're not excusing anything. It's just take an inventory. You know, what is actually true for you about you? And if we're not willing to do that, we're going to get stuck and we're going to stay stuck because how, if you're not honest with yourself about who you are, what you value, what you want, not what you think you should want and not who you think you should be. Mm. But if you're not honest, you're going to feel fragmented and the fastest way to get stuck is to feel fragmented because how do you know what boundaries need to be set if you don't know what you value how do you know where to invest your time and energy you know when people talk about balance like i just struggle with work life balance no you probably don't as much as you struggle with knowing what is important enough to you to set boundaries and to be uncomfortable enough so the short or that's a very long winded answer <laughs> to what do we need to not be stuck we need to be willing to get honest about the good the bad and the ugly about us without shaming ourselves just to be like, this is what's true. Here are the things I can change. Here are the things I can't change. What is true? What are my choices? And with this big, you know, box of stuff, what can I do today to start moving? Absolutely. And I think to the, the part that really makes people uncomfortable is, uh, taking risk. I think whenever you're doing something, um, dysfunctional, right? There's a lot of comfort in the dysfunction, right? And so to step out of that and do something that's actually much more beneficial, is like stepping away from that norm and taking a risk on doing the unknown for you. Right. And the myth is that making good changes feels good. And it doesn't. I mean, I used to be a pack a day smoker and my diet consisted of a pack of cigarettes, Mountain Dew, and like those rollers from the gas station, those like griller things. Like that's what I survived on. And when I started eating vegetables, I felt terrible. It was so distressing to my system to ingest healthy food. Cause I was so habituated to nicotine, caffeine, sugar, you know, sugar, fat, and whatever else. So it's like a detox, you know, anytime ask any heroin addict, how good did it feel to quit heroin those first few weeks? So whether it's, you know, starting a fitness program or eating healthy or journaling or starting a bit, yeah. whatever the thing is, It's not good. Even if it's something small, like I want to be more pleasant to my family during the day, like, okay. But if your habit is to not be any change, even positive change is going to feel awful for a while. And we need to be prepared for that. Otherwise we're going to give up and we're going to quit. Yeah. And I think that's good of you to say. Um, I think that's very important to say that, that, uh, you know, because a lot of people look at TV they, they read, right? They escape through these, um, these, uh, these media platforms. And that just doesn't paint a realistic picture of how it works. <laughs> no, you see the first point and you see the end point. And all movies have the montage, you know, where we're getting the change and there's all this lovely music and look at us go. But like the montage part of the movie is a really unpleasant, messy, yes. awful, just really uncomfortable stage that we have to pass through. And there's no cool soundtrack to guide us through that. Absolutely, you cannot (laughs) transform uh, from the ugly duckling to the swan overnight. (laughs) Like that's a great story, but no, but we're not told that. And so what happens? We feel guilty. I, I just guess I can't do it. I guess I don't have what it takes. I guess I'm not smart enough, strong enough, good enough, whatever. And that's just not true. It's no changing is hard and you are not very supported right now by your environment. We can only change in any direction to the degree that our environment will support that. And if your environment is not set up to support tr- like radical transformations, then don't set the bar there, set the bar somewhere that matches your level of support. Absolutely, because setting the bar can definitely be self-defeating and discouraging, you know, and I also want to take the time here to plug, ask for help. You know, there's so many people, again, um, which we're going to, you know, we'll try to get into, um, in, that have gone through trauma, um, like very similar to you, where you were talking about you're just kind of off in this world and you're by yourself, and therefore people think that recovery should be done in isolation and it does not in fact i always encourage quite the opposite so that's another another avenue too 
I don't know who said this because I wish I did so I can attribute credit, but the gist of it is we're injured by people. And so therefore the healing we need is going to come through people. That doesn't mean that we need other people to rescue us, but it does mean that we get injured by other humans. It seems logical that our healing has to be mediated also by other humans, not to mention our brains are designed for connection. So like, I'm an introvert. I love being alone. I love doing solo healing work. I love meditating and journaling and doing things in my own space, but like we are wired physically to connect with other people. That's just the design. I would agree with that. You talk a lot about trauma on your social media platform. Can you tell us in your, from your perspective, what trauma is to you? Mm. I will use the perspective of people who are much more educated than I am. The Meadows of Wickenburg, which is sort of the trauma mothership in Arizona, Uh like everyone I've trained under or studied or read comes like out of there. And they define trauma as anything less than nurturing. Mm. And by that definition, we all qualify. Now, some people get angry with that definition. Well, if, if it's anything less than nurturing, are you saying that my being abused as a child is the same thing as, you know, someone who forgot to say goodnight to you when you went to sleep? Like those are not the same. Well, no one's saying that all trauma is equal, but trauma is anything that's less than nurturing. Anything that doesn't support us can get stuck in our, and again, that doesn't mean everything is going to traumatize us, but that does mean that anything that's less than nurturing has the potential to get stuck or to create symptoms or to cause us some problems. And you can minimize that or pretend like that shouldn't be the case, but that actually is the case. It's sort of like brain indigestion. I don't know why some food sits well and some food doesn't. Some days I can eat cheeseburgers and some days I can't. And it's like, digestion is an automatic process. Your brain digesting your experiences is also an automatic process. So if your brain can't digest it, that's trauma and it can be caused by anything less than nurturing. Mm. And you talk about eight stages with respect to trauma. You know, there's stages and there's steps and there's so many subtypes. And I think it's important to not get hung up on the models. You know, like I could be like, okay, well, what stage am I in? Kind of like the stages of grief. It's like, well, where am I? It's like, let's not, don't worry about the entirety of the map right now. Let's just look at where are you? What are your choices versus why do I feel this way? And what's wrong with me? And I don't understand why I'm struggling, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, I hear you, but let's just really dial this down and make this very easy. I would agree. What's your option? What are you going to do about it today? What are your resources? It's a lot easier to move when you, when you make it small. One of the questions I had for you in this relates um, specifically to today's climate where we've had a lot of shootings, a lot of violence in the, in the United States and just a lot of things going on, the inflation, um, the, uh, mass resignation from jobs. Do you think, you know, from your perspective that some of these issues that we might be seeing could be related to that definition? Of of trauma? trauma? So the short answer is yes. The longer answer is for people that did not identify as trauma survivors prior to the pandemic, and who could be busy and go about their lives and generally be functional. You know, when people say the pandemic caused a mental illness epidemic, I would actually challenge that. I would say the pandemic revealed a mental, I don't like saying a mental illness epidemic, Mm -hmm. but the pandemic revealed what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is if you quiet down enough, we're lonely, we're isolated, we're disconnected. Mm -hmm. And the great resignation, which, you know, you could call the great, integration where people are finally going, okay, you know what? I've had enough. I am done going to a job that I don't like where I'm devalued, where I might be sexually harassed and underpaid and overworked. And that's a good thing. The great resignation makes it sound so like everyone's just quitting. It's like, no, everybody is getting wholly dissatisfied with what is, which is a good thing because our status quo wasn't working. And so the pandemic sort of opened up an opportunity for us to all 
make some big changes. It's really hard to make changes when the world is barreling down at its normal speed. But when the pandemic hit the brakes on everything, then we can look around. And again, I'm not ex- saying that this is an explanation for the shootings or anything like that. Oh, yeah. oh, but yeah. when the world is not working and there's no way to pretend like it is working, everyone lost all of their outlets. Yes. So now what are we going to do about it? And the people that are doing things about it, that's mm-hmm. what we're calling the great resignation. It's like, I get it. It's good. I just don't like the name. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would, I would agree with you. I do think that the pandemic has highlighted the things that, you know, we've been able to put a bandaid on for quite some time, just because life moved so fast, right? Um, Before the world shut down and the world made you actually stop uh, the, excuse me, the pandemic actually made you stop and sit in your own life and really start to take evaluation of those things like maybe things could have gone on another few years if you're still sort of zipping around and being social and going out and having the drink or you know hanging out with friends or you know doing whatever so things could keep moving as normal but when you have to actually go home to an unhappy place you actually have to go to work in an unhappy place and put your health at risk on top of other things, people get, uh, yeah, they start to see things clearly. Um, So yeah, thank you for breaking that down. It's a good thing to be dissatisfied with a broken system. You know, again, I don't know who said this, I think maybe Viktor Frankl, I don't know, but like an insane reaction to an insane environment is sane. So all of these things that we struggled with actually made a lot of sense in context. And now that the environment has sort of you know, the brakes were slammed and now we have choices again in a way that we really didn't before. And now things can actually shift, but I don't think it's a mental illness epidemic as much as people are realizing the environment was making us sick. It's not, you're not sick, but like, if you get sick in reaction to a sick environment, that doesn't mean that the problem is you. Absolutely. And I would also say that perhaps that it could be a parallel process where the the devaluation, um, the unnurturing environment, the dehumanizing environment may mirror a lot of what people grew up with. And so again, that that, um, became normalized over time, if that makes sense. It, I mean, a lot of things get normal. So Alice Miller, who wrote the drama of the yes. gifted child, yes. is one of my favorite. Never read Alice Miller before bed. I did that last night and I woke up screaming in the middle of the night. She writes about child abuse and just basically the way that violence against children is still largely ignored and children are considered to be, they belong to parents, to be treated by parents as parents see fit. And in order to survive that, they have to sort of just cope and adjust. And then those cycles perpetuate, but to acknowledge that as you know, when people say I had a good childhood, I owe it my, like my little senses go up there. I'm like, okay, hang on. You may not have had a impoverished, abusive environment as a child, but like being a kid is very, very difficult. It is incredibly difficult to be a child. And there is no, and I was a play therapist. I was, I worked with children early in my career. Yeah. There is no way to escape from childhood without some injuries. Absolutely. So if you said I had a good childhood, I'm going to go, okay, well, mm, I w- it doesn't mean your parents were bad. It just means you cannot be a child and emerge from that developmental stage without some injuries. And if we don't acknowledge them, we're going to repeat them or we're going to suffer or we're going to have symptoms or we're going to feel lazy. And it's a lot easier to face the injury than avoid it. I agree. I agree. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that and how that may relate to trauma bonding? Hmm. A a huge dilemma is so much of the dysfunction of childhood is normalized, you know, like families on TV yell and scream. And so we think that's just what families do. Like, that's how, of course, that's just, we're a family and we're just, a we're a yelling family. I'm like, that is, and I grew up in a yelling family. That is not healthy. <laughs> like, you know, or we just grew up with no boundary. I mean, I grew up with no boundaries and that was normal. It's like, that's not healthy. Just because something is normal does not mean that it is healthy and trauma bonding, it, you know, as a child, 
child, you have no other options. You are fully dependent on your caregivers, whoever they may be. And so you have to, at some level, ignore what's happening and bond with them because if they don't take care of you, you are going to die. And so we become bonded to people that are not treating us well to a degree. Again, it's not all the same. I'm not like demonizing all parents, but like, you know, all parents are human and no humans are perfect. Therefore, all children will be injured. So let's just nor- like let's normalize that and make that okay. But if you're going to bond with people that are not treating you well, then you're going to internalize the it must be me. I must not be deserving of being spoken to kindly. I must not be deserving of my body being respected and not, you know, either abused overtly or something as simple as hug grandma because she'll be sad if you don't. That is not actually, like that actually is abusive. Like, and people get so angry at me when I say that I'm like, I didn't come up with the rules. A child's body is theirs. And if they're not allowed to decide who they squish up against, then that is no longer helpful to them. Therefore it's less than nurturing. Therefore it's abusive. And again, we have to like, Oh my God, I've abused my children. If you're a parent and you've done that, no shame. That's how we were all socialized to treat children. And Trauma bonding is a result of that. So when we know more, we can do different things. So again, this isn't about shame. It's about let's do things in a healthier, more sustainable way. I agree. I do think a lot of it starts with childhood. And I think there's um, ch- there's an age old saying that children are to be seen and not heard. And so I think that a lot of times children's, a child's experiences can be invalidated or they are not allowed to have some form of control or autonomy, I'll say. Autonomy is maybe more appropriate. Uh, that's my child, right? That's usually what people say, or I'm, I'm the parent. And so when those things may feel challenged, you get that sort of that reactivity. But I think there is a lot of truth to getting down um, to a child's level and speaking to them in a way that they need and sort of validating their experiences in their bodies. Like you were saying, I do agree that, you know, if you're kind of forced to hug grandma or go sit on your uncle's lap and, you know, when people do touch you inappropriately, what are, what are you supposed to do with that? It's normalized by then. It's like, oh, that's what my body is for. It's for it to be grabbed and groped and, yeah. you know, and again, it's easier as a therapist than as a parent, you know, like when I work with kids, they're not my kids. So I have compassion on parents and what is the, the task of parenting. It's, it's in, you know, that's an enormous task, sure. but if you sit with children long enough, they are very smart. They are full of wisdom and they are constantly taking in data from the environment. So children should be seen and not heard as one do as I say, not as I do is another sort of law. Okay. That was, that was my childhood. Do as I say, not as I do. Well, I'm watching this, but you're telling me this. And so those wires are going to get crossed and it's going to create a lot of confusion. And if children are confused, how are they supposed to stay safe? Mm, I agree. Um, And when you talk about the safety, I'm interested to hear what are your thoughts on emotional incest? So it's, I almost, when I was writing my book, I almost like took it out because it's such that word just freaks people out. Like, what do you mean? Emotional incest? What are you talking about? Like, Mm -hmm. and yes, that is a strong, that is strong language, but it, that again, I didn't come up with the term. It's an old old word. Yeah. It's been around for a while. (laughs) It's been around for a long time and it has endured because it like the, the problem is that severe that it warrants being called that. So, okay. So incest, we all know is sexual contact between relatives. So emotional incest is not physical in nature. It's not like I am being physically touched or whatever. It's where a child is being used to pleasure, not sexually, but to serve at the pleasure of the parents. In other words, I have to give mom back rubs every single day, or I am, you know, daddy's little princess and my feelings and thoughts and needs don't matter. And I just need to, you know, tap dance and twirl and make sure everything I say and do makes my daddy happy because that's my job. So whenever it's the children's job to make the parents happy, secure, safe, that has entered. And the problem with emotional incest 
is that even though it's not physical, the after effects, they look exactly the same. Mm. A child who has never been, and again, I'm not comparing them. I'm not saying they're no, the yeah, same. Yeah. I'm saying that the output, if you have a child that's never been touched, but has always been made to be a surrogate spouse or a surrogate parent, and you have a child that's been physically sexually abused, they will often show the same exact symptoms. Mm. Like it's a problem. It's a real problem. What are some of the symptoms that uh, that they will uh, show? So people who have been either physically sexually abused or emotionally incested, whatever you want to call it, will often end up in very destructive relationships. They will often end up with very compulsive relationships to food or sex or alcohol and drugs. You'll see a lot of that compulsive comfort seeking later in life, a very unstable sense of self and incredibly, you know, like their sense of secure attachment to other people sort of hangs by a thread. It's like the slightest breeze will make me feel like you're going to abandon me. You know, I remember, you know, like if my roommate, when I was in college, like would go into the other room, I'm like, are you okay? Are you mad at me? Like, where are you going? And it's like, did I do something wrong? And like, are you coming back? Like a little puppy. And it really just completely destroys our sense of, I have a core self. And at my core, I am worthy of dignity and value and being treated well. And here's what I think. And it just completely obliterates any sense of self whatsoever yeah. that's very powerful and it makes a lot of sense I'm sure for a lot of people and you know I think the other thing to note is the emotional incest um, aspect physical and sexual abuse can stop right um, the, it can stop when there is um when there's people around so when you're mm -hmm. out in public um, it can stop when you grow up and you move away or you get out of that environment um, those things can stop if, if you if that's something that you grew up in emotional incest I think is quite to the contrary and mm -hmm. that that oftentimes will continue between child and parent even through adulthood through every single encounter you know, because it, it, again, it's not visible. So people don't necessarily recognize it, but it continues on through adulthood. I'm so glad you said, I never even thought of that in those terms, but you're so right. Like it's, and I see this when I have adults who are terrified of offending their parents by their life choices or an adult who wants to enter in a relationship, but their parent doesn't like you know, like for a woman whose dad doesn't like her boyfriends because she's daddy's little princess. I'm like, she's 35. At this point, daddy doesn't get a say on who she decides to partner up with, assuming that he's not, you know, violent or abusive. But I don't want to disappoint my father by, you know, doing this other thing mm -hmm. that is very much pervasive. And that can go on and on and on well mm -hmm. past the parents even past the parents' death. Absolutely. I have clients in their fifties who are still terrified of offending their parents. And the, even the notion of, Hey, you know, maybe your parents missed a few things, you know, they're not terrible people, but maybe let's look at the impact of this choice on you. It's like, no, 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 no. I can't, I can't dishonor. I cannot dishonor my parents. You know, the fear of upsetting your parents is very much a telltale sign. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, it's funny, but not funny. Um, you know, they've actually created some TV shows designed around this. I think, uh, you know, one that comes to mind is like family or fiance, or um, there's, I think there's another one I think is on Lifetime, like Mama's Boys or something like that, where a woman tries to marry a man that's very strongly that's a thing. attached to his mother. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, you kind of look at that and people wonder like, how the hell does it get to be so extreme? But that's exactly how those things start where the family is so enmeshed that they have control over that one person's life. And that person is not allowed to become their own individual autonomous adult and go out and marry and create their own family or have their own life. No, there's this strong pull to stay under mother, son and mother, uh, you know, with the mom and, and son show in particular, it's like mother 
is prioritized over wife or fiance. And it's like, if mom doesn't approve, if mom can't have her way, she's got to go. Wow. I can't it's believe very that's outrageous. a show. Very oh outrageous. Gosh. I mean, there's, 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 um, I'm trying to think, I haven't seen it, but I've seen like little clips, but I think there's been like episodes where moms and their adult children still like bathe together, like all kinds of just stuff that's unhealthy. But I think that is founded in that, in that, that emotional incest and how people just aren't allowed to escape that. Do you have any suggestions um, in terms of people who are battling with that? It's so, I have so it. much compassion on yeah. it. It's so <laughs> difficult. Yeah. It, is, it, it is so incredible. And in yeah. my personal, like my own personal story, you know, I have assault trauma and abuse and that addiction and the, uh, all of the things, the most difficult thing to contend with was the emotional incest piece. Absolutely. Poof. It is tough. And some people push back and say, well, what about cultural norms? You know, what if it's, no what if this is normal for, for the way we do things? And I would say, okay, great. What's, what is the effect of that on the adults? If you're looking at the adults raised in that system, just again, just because it's normal does not mean it's healthy. Yeah. Are those adults growing up and are they functional and are they able to hold space for happiness and sadness? And yeah. are they, you know, how are they functioning as adults? And if the answer is not well, then I don't care how normalized something might be that, you know, like I, I remember hearing, well, that's just how we do things. It's like, okay, well, I get that, but that how we do things isn't working. Yeah. So if you're, if you, if you think this might be you, my first thing is don't panic because immediately, and I see this in this room every single day, people start flipping out. Oh my God. Now everything I thought I knew about my life is over and my parents are monsters. And you know, it's like, no, no let's slow this down. Yeah. Let's just start with how much agency, how much autonomy do you feel as an adult to make decisions without upsetting your parents? Mm -hmm. Don't even, don't even worry about calling it incest right now, because that word tends to shut things down quickly. It's just like, how old do you feel relative to your parents? Do you feel like an adult? I still feel 13 when I'm around family members. It's like all of a sudden, everything I know as a grown person in my forties goes out the window. And I feel like a very snotty, angry, <laughs> early adolescent teenager. Isn't that interesting that, that, that how powerful that is that you have, you've almost regressed to a childlike state. Yes. When you right? met. Mm-hmm. So ask yourself, is that me? And if it's you, again, don't panic. Don't worry about <laughs> calling home and saying you emotionally incested me because that's not going to go well. But the most powerful resource that I've seen is I think her name is Patricia Love, who wrote the emotional incest syndrome, yes. what to do when a parent's love rules your life. Yes. Oh, it's so gross, but it's powerful and it's healing. And the alternative to not looking at it is to stay stuck with the after effects of it. Yeah. As awful as that process is, it is well worth the effort. Amen. I would say that. And I would also, I like the fact that you touched on the, um, you know, the cultural aspect, because I do think that's also a very important piece. And a lot of times, you know, on some of those shows, they will show people from different cultures. I think here in the U.S., a lot of us, um, the U.S. in general is a very individualistic society where we have the benefit and privilege of sort of, you know, doing things on our own and being independent. And that can also be a double-edged sword too, as what we're saying. But I think, you know, that sort of that level of differentiation or having those boundaries or wanting to sort of break free of that definitely becomes more of a challenge when you have a, a collectivistic culture and where family is everything and you have to you have to do what the family wants you to do. There is no individual sort of thought like we're in this as a team. Um, so we move as a group of people or we don't move at all. So I do think that that, yeah, that's a very interesting phenomenon. And I think that definitely requires um, maybe a little bit more of a different intervention, which I don't know that we can get to today. 
And whether it's a collectivist culture or an individualistic one, the same intervention applies, which is a radical commitment to what is true. So, okay, family is everything. Okay, these are, your, these are what your family defines as their norm. Okay, cool. Let's get really honest. How's everybody doing? You know, like, how's everybody in the family doing? If I were to look at each one and say, how are you doing? How are you sleeping? How are you eating? How's your relationship? How's your relationship to yourself? How content do you feel? How activated is your nervous system? Mm -hmm. And if we're looking with an honest lens in an emotionally incestuous family, no matter where, there's going to be some problems there. So I'm not saying you should completely abandon your cultural norms. I'm saying, let's look at some of the practices and evaluate how truthful can we get about the impact of these things? Absolutely. Well, Brett, this has been very informative. The time flew by. I can't believe it's almost 11. <laughs> Thank you for being willing to talk that you're the first person who I've had more than a, like a quick blippy kind of mention of this topic. Cause it's so, it's so hard. It's hard to be on the receipt for parents who have done this to their kids. Again, who are like flipping out going, Oh my God, I incested my kids. It's like, no shame. This is about healing. It's not about blaming and shaming. Absolutely. It's about let's, let's move forward together. No matter mm. what's happens, let's look forward and, and move. And we need to dig through them ick a little bit to do it I agree. but it's worth it I would agree and of course I love talking about this you know I'm a, I'm a talker so you know I can talk about this sidebar I'll mention this <laughs> <laughs> you know because I had the thought as you were talking about Alice Miller do you know the backstory to Alice Miller I actually do not you should from know. what I've read in her books. Yeah, it's she, you know, you have a very talk good time. about emotional incest and abusive parents. Alice Miller was and again, I don't know, allegedly, I'll say allegedly, um, was allegedly there's been some blogs and things like that, articles written about how she was also very arbitrary um, with her children as well. So that's an interesting little sidebar there. I'm going to have to go do a little <laughs> rabbit hole of research, but her books are so the, it's her books are the first, her books are first great. time I've seen that type of compassion for children mm -hmm. verbalized, regardless of what's mm -hmm. going on. The words, <laughs> the words themselves are, are very healing. They are. Yeah. Her books are phenomenal. So I, I love her books. I've read, I've, I think I've read just about every one of them, if not all of them, um, as well as the Patricia love book. And I'll definitely put those in the show notes um, so thank you for mentioning those um, because those are classics too um, the classic books I love um, but Brett how can people get in touch with you if they want to you know follow up with you and see what you're about and you know connect with you so you can find me on Instagram. It's just my name at Britt Frank. And my book is called The Science of Stuck. And you can find more about my work and the book and all the things at scienceofstuck.com. Good. And are there any sort of projects or anything that you're currently working on that we can support you with? I appreciate Well, the book just came out in March. Mm -hmm. So I have now learned you can't just write a book. Now you have to like be in the book marketing and sharing and promotion business. So I am adjusting to <laughs> that. So if you feel so inclined, share about it or feel free to leave a review. Or if you think someone would find it useful, please tell them about it. Definitely. Yeah, I'll have to definitely take a look at it and I'll definitely link it to the show notes. And I so appreciate you coming on and having this candid conversation with us today. Thank you so, so much. Yes, thank you. Okay. So what, did, what were your thoughts on that? Um, did any of that resonate with you as far as the topic of, you know, emotional incest, uh, where, you know, the boundaries with, you know, adult children and their parents are so enmeshed um, that, you know, it's, it's hard to have individual lives and individual autonomy and, you know, be seen as an individual with your own life, your own goals, your own visions, because your parents are just, um, 
you know, overly involved, for lack of a better word. Did any of that sort of resonate with you? Would love to hear what your thoughts are and talk all about it. So you know what to do if you're interested in continuing this conversation. Make sure you drop a comment down below if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you are you know, if you're part of the social media following, you know, definitely drop a, a comment down below on that post and sound off and let us know what your thoughts are. And you guys, it's been a pleasure talking with you, talking with Britt. I learned so much uh, from her. And until next time, you guys, you stay safe out there, take care of yourselves and be well. Check out the sneak preview of next week's episode. A microaggression is basically, it could be a verbal, um, you know, assault or insult on, you know, you as a Black female. And so when I teach the workshop on microaggressions, we talk about micro and macro. Um, mm. And micro um, aggressions are basically institutionalized systematic racism. But um, um, a microaggression is something that's kind of like an isolated event that can happen, you know, at a grocery store. It can happen in your workplace. It can happen in a therapy room. And so usually microaggressions come in, in the form of a lot of times verbally where someone is attacking maybe your vernacular. You know, you speak very well for a Black woman, right? <laughs> or it could be a form of, you know, can I touch your hair? I didn't know that, you know, you can wear you know, straight like this, and then you wear it this way another day.